Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 25, with myself Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Mm -hmm. So on today's show, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with industry um, and what's been going on in the world of film. Then we, well, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Martin W. Payne, who's a independent um, actor in the UK. Uh, so we've got that. Then we're also going to be doing our monthly horror talk and this month we're going to be discussing vampires and everything vampire related within films so without further ado over to you sam for industry so over the last few years there's been a lot of talk about there being a third tron film Ooh. um i actually haven't seen tron one or two which is weird i absolutely adore the soundtrack by daft punk and that's what actually leads into this because someone was recently one of the producers was talking and saying well, yeah we've been speaking to daft punk because that was their first, they got the script and then their first project was like, okay, thoughts to Daft Punk, trying the original director back from the second film. <clears throat> but during this time, Mr. Really, I just don't get him anymore, Jared Leo, has been attached to a Tron film for the last three years and he's still attached. So there is going to be a third Tron film with Daft Punk and for some reason, Jared Leo. And apparently they're not looking to reboot it it's going to be the same one. So I imagine, uh, what's his face will be in it? Jeff Bridges. Mm -hmm. Kind of sacrificed himself at the end of the second one, though. Well, no need to watch uh, the second <laughs> film anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Jared Leo's looking to jump on that franchise as he's desperately seeking his own franchise. Um, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't excite me because, I don't know, it's, it's Jared Leo. He just doesn't excite me whatsoever anymore. I'm more concerned about the fact that he's running a cult. But, uh. <laughs> I didn't know he was running a cult. That's for another time. Brad Pitt is attached to an action film, which kind of sounds really cool. Firstly, you don't really get many action films with Brad Pitt, and he's getting pretty old, so he's getting into that Liam Neeson, Brad Pitt stage. But then also, he just won an Oscar, so he can choose whatever he wants. So this film is from um, David Leitch, who is the guy who did uh, Deadpool 2, Hobson Shaw, and more importantly, he did the first John Wick with the other dude, who I can't remember his name, but he did John Wick. Uh. So this film is about five assassins on a train with a similar mission. And it's not too much else, but the fact that Brad Pitt's in it, and it's an assassin film in a train, and this guy's considered a great action director, I'm in. Yeah, there sounds like a lot of uh, kind of comedy potential in that as well. Yeah, yeah, this is the thing. I, I'm, it just sounds like an exciting kind of film. So we'll see if that goes. I mean, D David Leich has got a lot of films that he's trying to do at the moment. So we'll see. There was a film that came out in 2010 called Life in a Day. And Life in a Day was a really nice film. And I remember I got the opportunity to go to a screening of it. It was like a preview in the city. And Life in a Day was a collection of everyone's life across the world, from like the Amazon jungles to Portsdown Hill. It's really strange. Um, the directors who were involved with that was Ridley Scott and um, Kevin McDonald. So they decided to produce this and they decided to do a sequel. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a new one coming out made specifically for YouTube. So YouTube are funding them to do this again. I wonder if it's going to be as open as it was before where anyone could submit. I'm kind of curious because it was a really beautiful little film. It gave a bit of like a hope but also just showing you every just little corner that these people had captured from across the world. So it'd be interesting to see that in very different times. Cool. Thanks for that, Sam. Yeah. So, yeah, back with Sam, actually. So um, we've had the pleasure of working with Martin W. Payne on several different projects. Very talented actor. And um, during this week, Sam had the pleasure of conducting an interview with him. So, yeah, over to you, Sam. Right, I'm on Trash Out's Take with Martin W. Payne, a very good actor and a good friend of ours. How are you, man? Oh, not too bad, actually. Thanks so much. And uh, it's good to be on here at last. Yeah, we had you recently to discuss um, filming during coronavirus, but here we're talking more about you as an actor rather than just as a producer. Yeah, and, and also the, the, the impact of COVID-19 on everything. Uh, that's a very, uh, I suppose, technically specific area to be in, um, as opposed to actually being on camera and doing some crazy things. So, yeah, I know which side I'd prefer to be on. <laughs> <laughs> so what got you into acting? Um, eons ago, um, because of course everyone should know that I'm ancient, um, I 
Um, it was actually a careers evening at school. Um, so, you know, back, back in the days when we had the fifth year at school, rather than year 12 or 10 or whatever it is, I don't know. Um, there was a careers evening, and one of the places I wanted to actually go to um, was uh, onto the stage in the school hall to um, talk to a couple of people who sat behind a table um, who were representing a, um, a drama school. Uh, because I said to my, my parents who were with me that, oh, yeah, I f fancy really going to drama school after this because, you know, leave school, go, go to drama school, that'd be good. And um, I hadn't really shown that much interest in, in drama during my school years. Um, and um, they said, well, yeah, yeah, OK, you can go and talk to them, but um, I think we should also go and talk to the, these people over here. And, of course, then what happened was I went to... Um, college and I became an accountant. Obviously, the uh, going up on the careers evening to the drama school was uh, not the route <laughs> that uh, my parents intended for me. Um, um, and not surprisingly, given the fact that I suppose I was probably around about eight years old when I played um, Blind Pew in a um, school, primary school production of um, Peter Pan um, which was about the limit of my acting experience at that stage so uh, yeah that's 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 where I would have liked to have gone, not the case and so therefore just returned to acting in more later life um, because I, I got involved in, well my parents got involved in going to, as guests to a murder mystery uh, weekend Oh, yeah. And um, and uh, they booked one um, because they saw about it in the newspaper, and they simply said, "Yeah, okay, we booked it, and we're all going, the three of us." And I I chickened out. Um, I chickened out of my first murder weekend as a um, guest because I thought, "Oh, there'd be blood involved, and I've got a fear of blood." So I didn't really fancy the idea I, I I dropped out my aunt went instead and that caused a bit of chaos um, but they came back for that said it was really good so convinced me that I should go on a future uh, murder weekend which I did as a guest um, and we went probably around about 15 18 times over the next 4 or 5 years or something like that and then I got asked if I wanted to actually join the um, the company that produced the Motor Weekends. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so that's when I really started um, acting of any description. And that was about 25 years ago. And you're, so, you're still doing it as well, aren't you, the Motor Weekends? Yeah, um, obviously not at the moment because COVID-19, hotels are closed. Um, yeah, yeah, still doing those. Um, they're, they're really great for improv uh, because you get given a character. Uh, you get character details, you get the date of birth, uh, you get their family background, what they do as a job, any relationships they're with. Uh, and it's basically an A4 sheet of paper all about the character that you're playing. And then you get dumped down in the middle of a load of guests who can ask you questions about literally anything and you need to respond to them as a real person in character so someone can ask you your birthday um, and that's fine you can give them your birthday because you've memorised that because it was on the character details and then the real so-and-so's um, just come out with a, oh yeah right so what star sign are you <laughs> and you've got to know that level of detail um, and, and then you have arguments with people you have to have rows with other um, professional motor weekenders so you you just you know what the rouse about you know the point you've got to get across to this live audience but you don't actually know what you're going to say you don't know what the other character that you're arguing with is going to say back um, and you've just got to really um, spark off against each other get the point of the argument across um, maybe a bit of um, you know slap face or whatever um, and, and of course the absolutely brilliant um, don't you walk away from me um, comment being shouted after someone as they're trying to walk away because they finished their side of the argument and you're still thinking no I've still got something to say come back I need to say it in front of this audience um, 
and so I get my my I suppose my my love for improv from that because it, you it's not scripted you just can't, you just got to get out there and do it and people have got to believe you um, and there's no I think greater um, reaction you can get when you've had a really good argument or something um, you've walked out of the room and it's the absolute worst thing you can hear as a professional murder weekend but you walk out of the room and people start to clap because we're not in it for the, the applause we're in it for reality and you know you see two people arguing you don't go oh that was a really good argument well done clap you know yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah it's it's very different and skills to film acting. Is, um, what was weekends. your um, first film acting role? Uh, first film acting role, um, I, I, I I've been doing murder weekends for quite a number of years, and I. Twitter was fairly new as well um, at that stage. So this is about oh, eight years ago, something like that, maybe. Um, and I came across on Twitter um, a guy called uh, Tony Lane, uh, AD Lane. And he had a film on the go then, and uh, still does, actually. Uh, it's called Invasion of the Not Quite Dead. And he was spending time on Twitter just doing 24, 48, 72 hour tweeter fonts uh, where he just kept going, he kept tweeting, and it's all about raising awareness. And this is sort of predates crowdfunding. Um, and because it predated crowdfunding, if you were an independent filmmaker and you wanted to, other people to give you money to make a film, you just had to raise the awareness. You had to get out there. You had to ask people. And that's what Tony was doing. Uh, one of the things he did. Um, and, you know, professional actors will go, oh, how dare you? You know, uh, this totally goes against the grain of everything you could possibly do acting-wise. Uh, but one of the things he was doing was just saying, look, give us a, an amount of money. I can't remember how much it was now. And you can have a day on location so I thought well I, I do murder weekends I, I think I can act so um, I think I could play a character uh, but I've actually got no experience on film so why not yeah I support this guy uh, give him some money turn up on set and um, and see what it's all about so Invasion of the Not Quite Dead, I turned up expecting to be a, quote, lab coat man. Just an extra in the background, white lab coat, gas mask, so not not visible at all. And just be, but just do whatever he wanted me to do, you know, arrive at, I think I arrived around about 10.30 um, in the morning on a Saturday. Uh, due to leave by five uh, because, I mean, as you know, Sam, obviously uh, film, film productions always run on time, <laughs> and, uh, never yep. delayed. Um, yeah, so I, at least all yours are, I think. <clears throat> um, <laughs> and um, so I, I, I turned up for this, this extra role, lab coat guy, a uh, bit of background, um, and the first thing he says to me, um, A.D. Lane says to me, is I swore I'd never do this again. Uh, so I immediately thought, what, invite someone who's not an actor along onto a set? Oh, well, yeah, fine. Okay, but if you want me to go, says I, 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 you know, I can go. No, he says, no, 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 no. Um, he actually had an actor in mind for a role and um, it had fallen out with the actor the night before the actor said well I'm not turning up in the morning um, Tony says well that's fine I don't need you um, the, the actor says well yes you do because I'm playing this character Tony's response well that's right I'll sort something out and so I turn up and he says to me can you learn some lines can you change your voice slightly? Um, I fortunately had taken contact lenses with me anyway because I knew I'd be wearing a gas mask and I, I normally wear glasses. Wearing glasses under a gas mask, I don't know if you've tried it, it's impossible. Um, so I had contact lenses with me anyway. So he says, yeah, put your contacts in. Um, if you wouldn't mind staying a bit later um, because um, we'll film a scene with you saying some lines and so on and we'll, we'll, we'll make you this character. You can still do the lab coat guy 
uh, earlier on because you're wearing a gas mask, no one would recognise you. Mm. So I end up playing a character called the Creepy Man in Invasion of the Not Quite Dead. And it's only later that I realise that actually this could be a very significant character because he might actually be rather associated with the reason why what's happening in the film is actually happening. So that's Invasion of the Not Quite Dead. He started filming in 2008. They filmed some more just recently and you never know, it might actually get released sometime in 2021. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think it's worth all the stuff I've seen of it says it's worth the wait, but <laughs> I don't know when it's actually going to get released. Uh, so that was that was sort of the first film. So uh, when, more by accident than anything else. So when it comes to performing, what do you want to bring to a role? Not just for like the director, but also from what the audience get from it. What would what do you try to bring to it? It's. It's that background in in murder weekends. It's the if you're if you actually if you are a character in front of anywhere between thirty and one hundred and twenty guests, uh, which I have been on a murder weekend, you have to get across the fact that you are that person. It's 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 no more or less than that. Um, you're not acting as such. You are portraying a character, and you're doing whatever that character would do so that's what I try to bring to anything it, it's not me being an actor being me doing something I, I do try to make sure that, that there's the, the character is in there that I understand the 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 person inside mm. so that I can actually I mean this sounds all very you know party farty but it, it, it does uh, I think help me just to be able to go okay I understand the character I know what they would do and how they would react now I can't do things like accents I can't change my voice that much um, I can change my appearance slightly so you know you can look at a number of films that I've done and I'm sure you know, I'd look at it and go well I know it's me um, and I'm sure many people just go oh yeah we understand this is this is a Martin he's playing a character that's fine um, but what it is trying to do, what I'm trying to do is actually go no if I'm I, you know, as with, with you Sam um, if, if I play you know a vicar in, in Lonely Hearts then yeah, hopefully I come across as a different character to the um, dad character that I played in Toxic Rock. Yeah. Uh, and um, had I been in Millennial Killer, which is the other one that's out at the moment, um, far more than I was, because, you know, you, the circumstances behind that changed and I had to play a, a police character right at the end. You don't really see the character in that at all. No. There was no character in that. That was just me going, okay, I need to fill this hole because we've got a hole. Um, so, okay, just just fill that gap. Um, but other stuff that I'm in, um, you know, Mask of Fawn uh, for Maiko, uh, the character in that hopefully is different to the vicar, is different to the dad character in Toxic. Um, and, and that's what I try to do, is just what character is there? How would they react in their situation? And is that right that they would react that way? Um, I think one of the projects we've spoken about, Sam, um, which we haven't done yet, um, but I'm, I'm thinking here um, the film um, character called Stephen. I thought you were. <laughs> where, where, yeah, where you have suggested he would do this, and I'm going, no, he wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not just a case of going, ah, I think the character would do this. It's also the character wouldn't do that. Um, and, and it's, for me, there's an integrity there. Um, and that probably makes me a real nightmare to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've never worked with myself. <laughs> with, with that in mind, what kind of roles do you want to explore? Uh, I think the it, it 
it's always the ones that challenge. It, it's it's roles and films that challenge, and whether that's challenging me as an actor to be able to do something slightly different, or to to push boundaries, um, or that challenge the audience when watching it, so that they either find the film so absorbing they can't not watch it, or so hard to watch because they they don't want to watch the film, but they have to. Uh, or just the character that is um, perhaps ludicrous, perhaps extreme, uh, certainly unexpected. Uh, so it's the... Um, I, I think probably the, the best example is in... Um, Toxic Schlock, where my character um, is, is male, and he is, is obviously male, um, but the extreme that I went to for that was we wanted a character that dressed female. My my trademark almost is I, I have a goatee. Um, uh, that's my, my facial hair. At the moment, lockdown, <laughs> it's a full beard. But... Um, it, yeah, I have I have that. I I obviously couldn't play the character in Toxic Lock with a beard at all, so that had to come off. And I felt it was right for the character, even though he's very male, um, for him to be f fully waxed. Uh, there's a scene right at the beginning of um, Toxic Lock where where actually you see one character applying a, a wax strip um, to my legs and it being removed. I mean that was just the end of. Um, the, the removal of hair for that particular role and I like to think that the audience would be going we would not expect um, let's face it an ancient guy to actually go to that level of um, of, of extremes maybe or presenting the character in that exact way um, and then to be just going yeah but this is the character this is this is how he lives his life he lives the character lives his life dressing female so yeah of course I'll dress female um, as an actor because it's the character and it's right for them um, and particularly I think the um, the best bit in that film is that short sequence where it's you know the, the a real long shot, wide shot of um, the group of us walking along um, a, a footpath, uh, me wearing high heels, um, just going, yeah, I can wear high heels. Um, <laughs> I can walk along a rocky path. <laughs> I can not fall over. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the interesting thing. I've been, having been to like a film festivals with you and seen how audiences have responded to your performances, you've definitely been able to explore those kind of roles where it does make an audience go, whoa, I didn't expect that to happen from someone, as you say, of your age or just like <laughs> yeah. unexpectedness. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and just going into more like that, it, it's the... You need to. Why? Why do independent filmmaking if you a can't have fun and b if you can't challenge people? Um, mm -hmm. And whether that's the people you see on the film on the screen or the people watching. Oh. Um, and and it, you know it's it, it comes also back Sam to um, Lonely Hearts yeah, that's what uh, I was the, say, yeah. the, the screen <laughs> of that at Horror on Sea oh, yeah. at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think that challenged everybody, including us. <laughs> it was being in the men's toilets afterwards and hearing them still talking about what happens to you at the end of the film and just kind yeah. of like sensitively, you know, like clearly feeling the pain as if it would happen to them. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's film. It, it's not real. Mm. <laughs> but, but even better than just, you know, it, it, that sort of immediately after the film has been screened and people talk about it which is great um, actually at a film festival being able to talk to the audience and get their feedback instantly afterwards mm. it's the fact that on that weekend on the 
um, was it the first weekend or the second weekend of that year? I can't actually remember now. Um, but uh, I think it. But certainly, it was the it was on a Sunday um, that um, someone said to me, "Oh, yeah, you were Lonely Hearts, weren't you?" Um, so it's not just the case of immediately after the screening; it was 24 hours later. It could have been a week later, yeah. Um, and again, that was Horror on Sea 2019. Um, Horror on Sea January 2020. Um, you weren't there at the time, Sam, but um, someone said to me, oh, yeah, you, didn't you have Lonely Hearts here last year? Nice. Uh, that's great. Mm. People remembering after a year, yes, it has an impact. Why would we not want people to be talking about a film a year after we'd screened it? It's <laughs> so, that, yeah, absolutely, let's, let's push on that, and, and that's what I want to provide. Um, almost someone who... I regard myself as crazy, not stupid. So therefore, yeah, let's do something crazy that people rem will remember. Uh, because that's best for me as an actor, for the filmmaker, for the, the production, um, cast and crew. Like, uh, everybody wants to be in a memorable film. Mm. So that's what we should be achieving. And that's what I want to, to participate in. So <clears throat> with your limitations, now obviously there's going to be every ethical limitation or even like physical limitations of mm. what you wouldn't do for a role. So we're taking that out of consideration. Are there any particular characters that you really just would not want to play whatsoever? Um, I, it's a difficult question uh, because I don't know. Um, there are certain things that are just not me. Um, I... I I would say that in normal, in the normal world, um, there, there is a. This is probably a bad example, but it is, it's, it's all I can think of at the moment. Is um, or one of the things I can think of. Um, the there, there is a there is a there is a swear word. It's a nasty word. Uh, begins with the letter C. I never use it, and I will not use it even on this podcast. I will not say it. Um, but you know the C word. Yeah. Um, and I'm not talking cancer. Um, <laughs> the I will not use that word. So therefore, if I see that word in a script that I my character has to say it, then I will be instantly going, oh, not sure. Not sure, um, but even that, um, I have used the word on screen because you know, the, the director has said absolutely important that you use it. Uh, it comes back to my point about you look at the character, uh, you, you you try to inhabit the character, and would the character to use that word? Yes, fine. Then I will use it, and I I will push it out with as much venom as I possibly can muster, um, albeit. It probably immediately saying if I'm using it against the person, um, saying immediately afterwards to the the actor playing that character, I'm terribly sorry, it's not me. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it's saying stupid like that that would just still be a case of oh, yeah, I, get I, I wouldn't like to do it, but if I have to, then I will. Um, and the other example that's in my head is. Um, and yeah, I, I, I will mention one of the people involved uh, because you know him. Uh, Tony Newton uh, asked me to do um, a film for him um, some years back, and um, the part of well, what we didn't film was a scene with me holding one or two um, airsoft rifles. Um, in a outdoor environment and we didn't shoot that scene because I didn't know about it beforehand mm. and I arrived uh, where I was going to stay which was uh, with the, basically the filmmaking um, crew and I walked into this small house and um, almost the first thing I saw were these two guns six foot long in the living room and 
I was told, oh yeah, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to do this with those, or you're going to do this with those, um, and I refused to handle them because I, I'm not a guns person. I just didn't want to go down there, um, not without having thought about it. Mm. And that's why this is a difficult question for me to answer because someone can say, do this, um, and if it's a, you will do it now, and I've, I've just told you about this, uh, and therefore no thinking time, then my answer is going to potentially be, no way. But give me time to think about it. Give me time to work out that actually, yeah, this can be made to work for that character. I can sort of justify the use of this particular scene or the, the props or, or whatever it is. Um, and then, yes, I will do it. But I need a bit of thinking time. It's why I say I'm, I'm crazy, not stupid. I will do crazy things. Um, but I need to make sure that I'm in the right mind um, set for it. So, I mean, recently, um, having been to Horror on Sea, great film festival, if anyone hasn't been to it, they should go. Um, it's, I... I I met uh, Baz Hancher and for his film that he's currently just finishing, uh, Hate Little Rabbit, uh, he wanted a character who would hang himself. So, yeah, I wanted to give him a good hanging scene. So, to the extent of, we know it can be faked. We know that to make a... A hanging scene that looks good you shoot the top half you shoot the bottom half um, so you top half you get all the facial expressions you get the, the in this case a chain round the neck you can see it biting in you can really feel the pain of being hung um, and then you cut to seeing the, the legs kicking in empty space or kicking the stepladder away kicking legs in empty space and then you just keep swapping between the two and the audience think yeah we've, we've seen a hanging hmm. what I wanted to achieve was a full length shot of clearly me just hanging uh, by my neck from um, from a chain um, and you get a full length shot and there is no doubt that this guy has been hung um, I attempted it couldn't do it and that's the physical limitation that you referred to, uh, mm. Sam, that, um, yeah, sometimes you just have to go, if I was stupid, I would carry on and try to do this and really try to give that particular shot, which would be absolutely excellent um, to the filmmaker. But physical limitations, I just cannot do it. And the reason why I couldn't do it was it's actually quite tiring doing the earlier part of the scene where you shoot in top half, bottom half, um, and, and just basically my, my, my body was tired. So I couldn't actually give what I really wanted to give. Um, and the practical point, I'm, I'm crazy, not stupid, the practical point is I could feel the chain actually um, squashing my throat, my larynx. Mm. So at that point, you just go, no, this is really not going to work. So, nah. I won't do it, and I will always approach something like that saying, I'll give it a go, but if I really feel I can't do it, if I really feel it could hurt me for real, then nah, it, 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 it's not going to happen, um, but I'll go as far as I possibly can, because that's what's important, people looking at something and saying, this is real, people should, the audience should be questioning how did they do that when the only answer should be well we did it and then you just got to let people make their own mind up as to whether you're telling the truth or not so with that consideration let's go to a more happier place what do you yes. have a, do you have a favorite role um favorite role i in Murder Weekend terms, I think my favourite role is playing the um, the detective inspector because uh, the detective inspector in a Murder Week Weekend is 
happily, cheerfully useless. <laughs> for you know, we, we, uh, the way the motor weekend works is you, you generally have free death over the course of the weekend. You as a hotel guest are trying to solve who done it, um, and all you get is a useless copper who turns up, who doesn't seem to know what he's doing, um, talks to you a couple of times. You know, so the, there's a, there's a murder. So he tells you how they've died and anything you know, like they've, they've got any drugs in their system or whatever, anything like that. But seems really incompetent until after the third death on a Saturday night when suddenly the role of the copper changes and it's more a case of, yeah, use them as a sounding board So and therefore you get people actually talking to you about their all their theories on this, this death. Um, and, and then suddenly, surprisingly, uh, 11.30 on a Sunday morning, he's standing in front of the... Um, the audience, the hotel guests, um, as they anywhere between 30 and 120 um, guests in, in front of you, telling them exactly what's happened, why it's happened, and everything. And he seems to have pieced it all together in a matter of moments. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely, because we know what the answer is before we even start. But um, so you get great interaction with with guests, um, and you're talking with real people in a film sense. I don't think I have an absolute favourite role. I appreciate the roles that I have done, some more than others, and the ones I will talk about are probably the ones that have had an impact on me, so therefore Toxic Shock, Dad, uh, the Lonely Hearts, the, the Vicar, um, Mask of Fawn, uh, and, and the, the father in, in that one. Um, Invasion of the Not Quite Dead, um, Creepy Man, it probably isn't a favourite role, but it's one that I hope, I'm, when I eventually see it, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to be very proud about. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's probably what's there more than enjoy. It's, it's probably just a, yeah, when you're doing it, as long as it's fun. Okay, so I, uh, I did one rec a short film recently with Jason Impey, um, and this was very much in COVID um, filming um, technique of a uh, very small crew, uh, one actor, me, um, I, there was five of us in total, but that's it, um, filming outside, distanced, um, and... It was just a fun shoot. It's fun to be filming again after a three-month period of absolutely nothing. I know, I know you've recently had that as well, Sam. Mm. You've had that feeling of, hey, it's great to be back working. Um, and, um, and again, it, it, when you're filming something, it's just as long as it's fun, then it's always going to be enjoyable. And, yeah, yeah I, I, I still... I, I've sort of rattled on for a bit. Uh, the reason for that is, have I actually got a favourite character? I don't think I have. I've, I've yet to find my all-time favourite character. It's that character is probably still coming. Yeah, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, this leads no. me quite nicely into the last question. So my actual favourite performance from you is in Monstrous from uh, Jackson Bachelor's film, which obviously is still in like the final stages and no one's seen yet. Yeah. But I think it's your best performance. I think it's hilarious. I think the character comes across perfectly how Jackson wanted it and how me and him wrote it. And I can't wait for people to see that guy. So that kind of leads me into to just, you know, let's have a bit talk about what you do have in the future. Now, obviously, the COVID times, you had a lot more more, but you know things changed unfortunately <laughs> but you, you yeah, had a few changed. performances last year and some stuff so what can we see for our festivals in 2021 from you um, who knows um, because I mean festivals are a lot unto themselves aren't they um, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you know true. that's um, you know, all, all, the, all the films that you expect to get into a festival no no you're all going to reject <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I like that you say that about um, Monstrous, and because that's not a character that I've talked about, because you know, it, it's been filmed, but it's not out there. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that you think that that character is different to the other characters, because, as I said earlier, that's what I want to achieve. I think he is as well, um, and for that character, I was very much channeling the um, the sort of Nigel Farage view of Britain and Europe, uh, monstrous being set around the, uh, the the Brexit referendum. 
Um, and so, therefore, and, and with the latitude of just being able to go and talk, improvise about, you know, the particular scene, the subject you, that needed to be covered in that scene, and just being able to say the most ludicrous of things. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's the watching it back pre-release, hey, um, <laughs> but it's the watching it back and just going, I really don't know why I said yes yes let's have cake because that is such a useless line inconsequential but I understand it makes Jackson laugh it's so British just because of where it is and it, you know and so therefore um, I think it's an area that I hadn't necessarily explored being almost a, a comic character um he doesn't think he's comic, obviously. Yeah. He, he thinks he, he's deadly serious about Europe and how bad it is and the the need for the referendum and the fact that we have to leave Europe. Um, but um, that's not necessarily my view, so, yeah, you, yeah, you, you forced me to act, damn you. Um, and the same with Mask of Fawn to an extent. I play that very straight, but people look on it and go, it's quite comical um, in terms of it's so serious. Um, oh, another Maiko one, um, Slapeful Falls, I play a mad professor style character. And again, that comes across very comical, whereas I'm just going totally serious on it. So it's that. that it's that comic area that I probably might like want to go and explore at some point in the future. Mm. In terms of stuff coming out, um, as I say, I did Baz Hancher's um, Hate Little Rabbit, which he's hoping to get finished and submitted for Horror on Sea next year. Um, that's a feature. Um, the I've worked with Tom Lee Rutter and um, his uh, pocket a film of superstitions um, which he has also been delayed with COVID on filming and will come out at some point probably next year uh, so yeah whether that gets into horror on sea I, I, I don't think he's planning on putting it in there because he doesn't think it will be ready in time <laughs> Uh, I should have been filming for Myco Entertainment and Slasher House Free. Um, in fact, actually, just before lockdown, I was doing a short, um, producing, stroke directing a short for Trash Arts Killers Free yeah. on yeah. Sunday of whatever day it was in March, just before lockdown, so around about the 22nd. Um, and on the Saturday, I was due to have been filming a Sleepful Falls a short film for Myco. Um, both of those shoots got cancelled because uh, lockdown um, or lockdown was imminent. Uh, we decided it wasn't safe to be filming. So you know, that gets cancelled. As a side effect of that, there's one we wish to be shooting at the beginning of May, yeah. which was um, also has been deferred um, so that's underneath working title um, and I should have been out in Switzerland at the end of um, June in order to film a feature with a uh, Swiss filmmaker um, very much pushing for extreme horror on that one um, and uh, that's been delayed until sometime next year probably and that's mainly delayed because I can make it across to Switzerland mm. because we weren't able to travel out of the UK so yeah the, the, the virus has had a big impact on filmmaking in all, at all levels um, I just hope that well, I know things, opportunities will come along, and I will always be pushing myself in to try to work for um, certain directors that I've got on my hit list. Um, something hopefully will come out from them, um, and we can get it shot in the you know the next year or so, and, and then probably it will take us about a year before we're back to where we were in the UK film industry um, just 
trying to make um, good films. Fears, you will always be prolific, and you've been prolific over the last few years, and there will always be opportunities, like you said, so you're always keeping your ear out on it. Thank you so much for joining us, Martin. I hope you have a good evening. And yeah, yeah. I should, should I do, yeah. And I um, look forward to listening to, to all this back because I've forgotten exactly what I said <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> That's usually the case, you know. But yeah, be out on Sunday. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's out now, it's not on Sunday. Yeah. Thank you for joining yeah. us. No problems, thank you, Sam. Bye bye. Bye. Cool, thanks for that, Sam. Great chat. Um, so, yeah, this month, guys, in our monthly horror chat, we decided to discuss vampires and um, vampires in films and um, what the, the kind of connotations and stuff are of them being within a film. So, for me personally, to kick it off, my personal favourite would have to be Interview with a Vampire. So, I like the way that the, the kind of structure of it, so that they, they basically shows you what it's like to be it, as that person in that age throughout generations of time mm. and the kind of connotations that that then brings and because if, if you think about Brad Pitt's character he basically saves Kirsten Dunst but then well kind of in a sense curses her for the rest of her life and you see that develop as she gets older but doesn't age and she can't deal with that and basically wants to get out of it well it's also it's, it, the thing with that film is it is that kind of if you're stuck at such a young age and you've lived through every single time, you're living a life of decadence and hedonistic kind of drives. Mm. So even in the way they're dressed, they're all they're dressed in much higher clothes, aren't they? And they're very decadent. They're having the, the big kind of social events. They're borderline, from what I remember, like socialites in that film, but it's like 1700 socialites, you know? Yeah. Because it's the whole idea of him even recounting it to someone who's a journalist. That's the whole story, isn't it? He's yeah, He's recounting yeah. the whole life from, like, modern world. And I think... Um, or at least from whenever he got turned into a vampire. Yeah, and that's it. Like, vampire films can always represent that side of life that's a little bit more dangerous well I think that's the, that, that's what I think is so interesting about vampires is you can show so many different aspects of it so you've not only got that infinite life you've got that danger element mm. the idea of sort of um, feeding off another human being in order to keep your own life going um, that sort of like super strength kind of idea that transformation into like other th- you know there's so many different elements I think as well it's, it's, with that you can um, take a vampire story and put it in any piece, of, like or any time in history, and you can use it to analyse any kind, like so many different elements of things that you know you couldn't necessarily do um, with with other, you know, in, in such I a mean, sort of physical way. It, yeah, it's interesting you say that. I would, I'd argue with vampires because they're so down to what it is to be human mm. and what it is in growth and change. So, um, if we were to look at when looking at vampires being stuck at a young age that idea if you look at youth and if you look at the film in particular um, Fright Night yep. Fright Night is very much like that's you know it's about some teenagers who find out a vampire's moving next door he's all mysterious kind of handsome kind of sexy the females around him are attracted towards him and there's that fight of the temptation of him being like you become a vampire and it's that idea through hormones of it's good to say it's like puberty yeah and you see that constantly with vampire films, the temptation, the desire to try and, like, be something more. But it's never... Because it's, it, goes, it surpasses what humanity's drive for economic reasoning. It's literally for elongating life and being stronger, like you said. Mm. And um, I think what, what you always find in vampire films is eventually... And again, like a turn um, into a vampire... It's, there's that point of, well, how long is this going to go on? Mm. I have lived a long life that I don't want to live anymore. And I think that's the vampire curse. Like every sort of film will go back to that element of, sure, it's great to live forever. It's great to do all this, but there are many things you're going to be sacrificing. I think as well with that, <coughs> it's almost the, um, the mental health side of it as well like how many times can you go through because like even with interview with a vampire they kind of come into contact with so many different people throughout the course of film and it, it does this with loads of different vampire films as well but like are you willing or are you headstrong enough to fall in love with someone or to care about someone yeah. enough that you can let them die um 
or do you turn them? Like, and then that brings its own connotations as well because then you've put them into that kind of curse as, as well that you're living. So it, it's that whole kind of mental stability throughout it. Are you strong enough to deal with that extra pressure of love and loss? Well, I, think it's, I think it's interesting because this is obviously what we've taken from like modern vampire films have become more about this. But when you look back to sort of the original, um, like Nosferatu, it's very and dark. Like, and it's much more about the um, the predatory sort of nature of it in mm. some ways and like the, the, that slow kind of like uh, slow kind of attack it's not it's not so much a, you know they, they, they're sort of walking up to them they're, they are under their trance they they have them under control entirely and uh, I'd argue with with Nosferatu if we look at the time uh, 1922 yeah so that was post World War one mm. and what Nosferatu does so beautifully and bleakly is the grimness, the fact that death is slowly spreading and it's coming from Europe back to Britain. And it's very much a reflection of how people felt. So it does play really nicely into that. And if you look, that's the thing, the history of vampire films. Weirdly, vampires have been around since the beginning of cinema. There have always been vampire stories. And you could connect the fact that vampires as a supernatural idea have been there since the beginning of time. But if you really look at the fact when Dracula was written, it was what? 1890s, something around that sort of time. Hmm. So cinema's just born around the corner, that fascination with what a vampire is still going to be there. And yet, Nosferatu was the first, I suppose, copyright-free version of Dracula. <laughs> it's a similar story, a couple of little tweaks. And um, I think with Nosferatu as well, when you look at how that story was retold from Werner Herzog's perspective, yeah. it again returns to that idea of something that because he's a, a vampire in pain. Mm. He doesn't want, he, he has to live, but he doesn't want to live on forever. He's almost in pain with his movements and stuff. And a lot of that's down to Klaus Kinski's very mysteriously strange interpretation of it. But then I suppose if the original guy, Max Schreck, disappeared when he was playing Nosferatu, you gotta go a little bit further when going for a remake. I think. <coughs> It's interesting because, like, with vampire films, I think there has been a progression in terms of rather than it just being predatory. So initially, it's the fear element. It's like there's this creature that you don't really know much about that's lurking in the shadows and can mm. strike you and kill you or turn you, like, depending on their preference. Um, to now, you have a lot more emotionally driven from the perspective of the vampires and the emotion that they're going through. But in terms of that predatory style, I think what it does is it plays on the vulnerability of people. So again, with the the whole sort of teenage thing, yeah, yeah, it's like um, especially with Fright Night. I know in the remake, like you have his girlfriend ends up getting turned and he can't deal with it, and it's like you know you're at a loss. Well, even even Lost Boys does the same thing. Yeah, it's a very much eighties thing when you see those vampire films that were aimed at teenage audience. It played on the vulnerabilities where. There are that especially I always find in Lost Boys where there are the borderline between being kids still and then oh shit there's vampires here and his older brother's the one who's becoming a vampire but it's the younger brother who's reading the comic books and trying to you know so it's, it's that weird battle between becoming from a kid into an adult yeah and vampires are that dangerous element where you know you could live forever but you can still have that like adult life I guess you know so what would you guys make of From Dusk Till Dawn because that's probably one of the, the weirdest vampire films that I've ever seen is that it completely subverts your expectation from what it starts off as as a film to well, then it, what happens halfway through it's interesting I recently learned something about From Dusk Till Dawn which I didn't know it was originally going to be a Tales of the Crypt film Really? So when you think of it like that, it's like, oh, it's a classic-y sort of horror twist, really. Um, From Dusk to Dawn's a weird one as well, because there's, there's like three films and there's the TV series of it. And it's more mythology-based than the first film leads on to, mm. because of the history of, like, as you saw at the end, when the camera zooms out, it's basically like, almost like an Aztec fucking temple and yeah. all those cars in the pit. So it's actually playing more with, like... Yeah, it was leading you into a bigger story, I guess, with, with From Dusk Till Dawn. From Dusk Till Dawn, though, it is really just like, it's a 90s film. It's a 90s film through and through. It's got Tarantino, it's got Robert Riggs, it's got bloody Harvey Keitel in it. It's clearly like, it's a brilliant film, don't get me wrong. And it slips into that, that other area of like action horror with um, especially vampires. 
Um, Another film that came out around exactly the same time, which does not work as well, and this is my problem with vampire action films, is actually John Carpenter's Vampires, which is an action western vampire film that fails completely. It's just too... There's a point where vampires can be very, very cheesy, mm, yeah. and it's really easy to do that within the action, because you have to obviously prioritise looking cool. Yeah. And vampires instinctively are quite cool concepts because they're dangerous. Not because they can do loads of action CGI stunts all over the place. It's my main problem. Or with they films. have hip clothing. Yeah, it's like the underworld <laughs> films. It plays into an audience that's already kind of like you know emo goth. Yeah, vampires and goths are always going to be two things that connect together because of Dracula, because he's you know he's the man in black. He's he's gothic as fuck. So when you come round all the way to having what's her face Kate Beckinsale in tight leathers running around doing action scenes it's kind of like yeah it's cool I guess but it's sort of she doesn't really you're playing at that point vampires are more interesting to use as a, as a sort of tool to like uh, analyse something else mm. within humanity that's like a desire or something like that I think when you start just making it like you know they're badass vampires I think it, it sort of loses its it does and it doesn't I think like in re- more recent times, when films filmmakers have tried to do that, it hasn't landed. Like the Underworld, first one's decent, but then it just tails off, and they try to make a franchise out of it, and it just doesn't work. But then I would argue that Blade, well, yeah, does it successfully. yeah, Blade. I, I didn't That's, think about that, but then I think of that more as a comic book film than yeah, so yeah, vampire. yeah. Plus it's, it's, like, it's vampires. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. The thing that makes Blade work so well is it has a real love for exploitation, mm-hmm. and I think um, there's a whole. Like in the 70s, black exploitation, they did a lot of vampire films. There was um, Ganja and Hess, there was Blackula. And um, those sort of stories were very much more like prominently powerful black men. And almost like, it's a hard one because the vampirism becomes then a cultural thing. Yeah. <coughs> of who they are and who, who the archetype stereotype of the beast of who they are as well. Because there is always that beastly element of vampire. And even um, Francois Capellas did it with his version of Dracula. Where it showed him as... Is that with Gary Oldman? Yeah, it shows him as the older man that's desperately dying. And then it shows him as the younger man, but it also shows him as this literal monster. Where he runs around like a wolf monster. And I like that idea of vampirism. There's that fine line where you're, you know, vampire man. Where you're pure beast. Mm. And then there's the line where you're just elegantly living through life and taking what you want, almost. It's... uh, it's a weird one. There is the other perspective as well with vampire films. When you have the one, I suppose, like the, the Remfield sort of character. And when I think of a modern interpretation of that, where it's kind of a beautiful love story, but still innocent, but not, is um, let the right one in. Yeah. Because from that, your, your, your main character is the little boy. And you never see any of the parents. The camera's like barely ever shows what the parents are and him connecting with this little girl who happens to be a vampire. And when she has to feed, she takes on that more beastly side completely. And um, that's the thing, you can tell a very beautiful connecting love story or something, because it's not love, it's that like that eternal connection because they've been around for so long and when you put them with someone who hasn't been around that long and starting to understand the world mm. and it connects, they even achieves it in um, the remake, Let Me, is it Let Me In? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, you, you see a lot, and of course it gets watered down with with Twilight and stuff like that. I was just you, about to ask you guys what your thoughts were on Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a weird one, right? Twilight first film is a good film. It's it, I mean I haven't watched it in a long time, but it, as a story, it's just it just it's because uh, the budget was a lot lower. It was an indie film, the first film. Like it wasn't hundreds of millions budget. It was like twenty million. It was made by a good director. And it just went, all right, it's good self-contained. It plays with all those vampire ideas of living forever, youthful love. But then it They sparkle in the sun, Sam. Come on. <laughs> I, I wouldn't watch well, it in a rush. I think, I think, to be honest, they're based, like, the, the sort of uh, original material isn't exactly strong foundations no, no. to start off on with Twilight anyway. But um, uh, and that's going it. back to that sort of, like, action thing, I think the most interesting sort of vampire action film I, I would say it's, it was action but action horror probably um, Van Helsing uh, Affliction uh. Um, Afflicted Afflicted yeah, yeah. Afflicted um, yeah that's a very interesting vampire film uh, because you uh, it, it's essentially about two guys uh, they go away on holiday I think it's to France Paris is it Paris yeah because yeah 
um, the two American guys and they're sort of videoing their own holiday and so it's it's found footage style but one of them starts transforming into a vampire um, and and like you, you're just seeing sort of everything he's got like a body cam on when he's like yeah, um, it's mental. when he's finally transformed he's leaping from building to building fucking attacking people and so it's just mental it's crazy crazy and it looked good it, it looks mm. believable there's an interesting point when it comes because that film is pretty much like the transformation mm. and it's very important with vampire films that process of transformation yeah. And because the vampire as a, a law has been around for so long, especially in films, we know what kind of things to expect. And you can play it for laughs, or you can play it for crazy absurdism, like Vampire's Kiss. Because Vampire's <laughs> Kiss is basically American Psycho, but instead of him wanting to be a fucking serial killer, he wants to be a vampire, or thinks he's a vampire. <laughs> and he has rubber fangs, and he eats cockroaches, and he <sighs> sleeps in his coffin that he's made, which is basically just his sofa spun. And he just loses his mind because he's a yuppie, and they're already sociopaths. And that story plays it really well, because you know the archetypes of a vampire film. And when you play it for comedy effect, like what we do in The Shadows, you know what all those things that are going to come up. And you're yeah. almost excited when they're playing on those stereotypes, like the coffins mm. or uh, bats. The way they play bats in that is hilarious because they give them a bit more personality where they're fighting each other. And, <laughs> and because their world is completely aware that it exists, there's no surprise. It's all when they're like, oh, bat fight. No, <laughs> yeah, they almost play up to it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, vampires have been around for so long that we can kind of lean into that a bit, where we know what to expect from a vampire film. You don't necessarily need to be like, oh, well, here's a new thing you didn't know about vampires. Because mm. then it goes, well, it's not really a vampire. I think Van Helsing's awesome as well. But that, again, that, see, I don't like, there's just action vampire films yeah, made for like teenagers. But it does play on every <laughs> single archetype. You see them more. Like it, I remember one good bit in that film, and that's the mirror shot where he's dancing with her and he's not in the mirror sort of thing. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and it's great. There are so many things like that you see and you're always like, well, how are they going to artistically interpret that vampire thing? Hmm. I mean, I talked about it last week, but The Addiction, this black and white vampire film set in New York by Abel Ferreira. Um, it completely encapsulates everything you expect in a vampire film, but it's on a gritty level and it's just played around a bit and just given a weird absurdism to it but also really darkly gothic at the same time because it is a really dark concept of someone surviving through drinking blood mm. you know that the rest of the body will continue going as long as it gets that drive it's i think that's a that's one of the main things about about the way that um you know vampire films look at sort of humanity is through that that self-discipline mm. kind of uh that you know knowing that you shouldn't do something and deciding not to do it and like the idea of turning into a vampire you know there's the transformation sort of moment that someone kind of uh, characters often like lose it and can't control themselves and, and yeah. stop being able to um, rationalise things in the same way as they did and, and it's interesting because that's that plays through not, not only violence and their bloodlust but also sex it mm. comes through on um, like many many other aspects that kind of makes you question our sort of the, how humans um, behave and how mm. we think and how we you know moderate ourselves essentially I think that's why vampire story is always going to be there because like you said it connects with who we are as humans mm. and for a lot of people things they don't want to focus on a lot of vampire stories will always have that there is a more repressed either hero or someone who's going to be turned and then the more dangerous I suppose free like yeah. vampires generally speaking in a sexuality sense they're not rigid <laughs> they're not like I'm yeah. only going to sleep with one person type thing but I'm going to sleep with whoever I want and spread you know the vampirism around <laughs> vampirism <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, that's one thing that I haven't seen uh, va a vampire film do and I, you know there might be the film out there that looks at this um, please Link me in the uh, description in the comments if you if you do know of one. Um, uh, but one that explores, uh, you know, because you talked about how vampires uh, are freer than we are and they are able to just do whatever they want to do. Yeah. But really, are they free? Because they have to feed on on 
uh, well, human that's, beings. I suppose that's let the right one in, isn't well, it? Well, that's pretty much like you do see that story in really good vampire stories. Mm. They have to play with that idea because there's like when you see those group vampire ones, like um, Near Dark or Lost Boys, one of those films, there's always going to be one in the group who feels like, yeah, this is it. And yeah. There's going to be the moral conscience within another member of the group who's going to be like, is this it? And yeah. is this right? Yeah, but I, I think that generally it, it morality has to play a role. Yeah, yeah. morality. Yeah, but 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 freedom. If you, uh, like you are reliant on on other people in in order to feed and to survive so in, a, in that way. You can't self sustain. So it's like you're free, but you're not free. There's a film called Daybreakers with Ethan Hawke in it. It came out towards the end of the noughties, and um, I think it was the noughties or 2010, something like that. Um, and basically. It's set 10 years in the future. It's 2009, so set 10 years in the future, 2019, and a plague has basically turned pretty much all of humanity into vampires, mm. and there's a shortage of blood. So they have to try and work out a way to save humanity or a vampire race to then kind of keep going. Oh, that's interesting. It's a good concept. It's just not an amazing film, but... Mm. The thing is, with vampirism, <clears throat> when you think of the people who want to be a vampire, yeah? Mm. Like the ones who do all the work for them and all that kind of stuff... The very drive to be a vampire is it's supposed to be an elite species, mm. that it is better than being human. So there is always that line where it, it is something that a lot of people can't achieve. So when, when you see that, the, the morality line is always going to come at the end. It's like being rich. It's like being part of a rich elite group and then realizing, oh, shit, they do a lot of dark stuff to keep rich. <laughs> it's that same thing. It's like yeah. a strange sacrifice they've done, you know? No. Yeah. Cool, so that was an interesting chat. Thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoyed this week's um, podcast. So, as ever, please leave us a like, leave us a comment. If there's any kind of vampire films that you feel that we missed, please leave a comment um, and let us know what they were. Um, also, check out our website, which is www.trasharts.co.uk. We'll leave a link in the description below as well, so you guys can check that out and um, keep up to date with all of our films and um, short films, etc. Everything that's trash arts. Um, but other than that, guys, please subscribe and uh, trash arts take out. Sada. Bye.